Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you. Many nations will join with me on that day and will become my people. The prophet Zechariah's words are on the minds, the hearts, the lips of the people as Jesus marches into Jerusalem. The Prince of Peace enters the city from the east, riding on a donkey colt, just as Zechariah said he would. The Roman governor enters Jerusalem from the west with an imperial cavalry to remind the people who has the power. This dramatic contrast is intentional. The stage is set by Passover. Passover, the week-long celebration of the Israelites' liberation from slavery in Egypt. Passover marks overthrow of oppression when they marked their doors with blood. So Yahweh's angel would pass over their houses on a murderous rampage, the last of the ten plagues of Egypt. It won't be long now, it won't be long. As the Jews enter Jerusalem, preparing for this beloved week, recalling their freedom from hundreds of years of slavery, they are living under Roman occupation. They have friends and relatives again in slavery in other parts of the Roman Empire. And the poor peasant class of Jews blames both Rome and the Jewish aristocracy for their plight. Pilate and Jesus and the people in their parades know all of this. Pilate's triumphant, militarily mighty entrance to the city is a reminder not to try any overthrow this Passover. Jesus' palm-strewn, cult-ridden entrance is just as intentional. The prophet Zechariah says, Your king is coming to you humble and mounted on the colt of a donkey. He will banish war from the land. He will be a prince of peace. It won't be long now. It won't be long. Jerusalem must be the stage for this passionate Passover play. It is the center of power in the Jewish world, political, economic, and religious power. And they all live in one house, the temple. Jerusalem was home during the good old days of King David 1,000 years before. David, universal hero of the Israelites, a shepherd boy who takes down a giant, a king who dances naked in the street, a ruler who brings unity and prosperity to the people. David's son Solomon secedes him and concentrates wealth and power in Jerusalem. Solomon builds the first and most beautiful, most elaborate temple for the Israelites. Solomon's legacy is mixed. He is the king of wealth and wisdom, but he turns emperor-like and sows conflict among the people. When he dies, the 12 tribes of Israel split in civil war, and 1,000 years later, when Jesus and Pilate march into Jerusalem, the Jews are still waiting for a Messiah to reunite the two kingdoms. It won't be long now, it won't be long. Solomon's temple is destroyed a few centuries after his death, but another takes its place, and Herod the Great expands it soon before Jesus' birth. But what began as a place for the God of the Israelites to call home is now the center of Roman rule over the Jews. The temple may be filled with a corrupt troop of elite priests who bleed the people dry to appease Rome and their own pockets, but this is the home of God, and it is the center of Jewish life. Jerusalem is the home of Roman imperialism and Jewish colluders, but it is God's home too. We've been journeying with Jesus this Lent toward Jerusalem. It won't be long now. It won't be long. We've been praying for Jesus to be with us and guide us. The Messiah enters through the Golden Gate, prophesies Ezekiel. Jesus rides a donkey through that Golden Gate on the east side of the city. Jesus rides into town like the rising sun from the east, and the people know he is the Messiah. They join his march, they throw down their coats, they pick up their branches. They cheer Messiah here to change the world. Days later, these people watch Jesus stumble through the streets toward death. No one shouts Hosanna. No one throws down a coat or waves a branch. The one they praised with Hosanna, they will ridicule with 
He said he was king of the Jews. They believe he failed as Messiah. Did he unite the two kingdoms? Did he overthrow Roman oppression? How often do marches end in death? I've been on a lot of marches. I've never been injured. I have been harassed. I have been spit on. I lived in India as a child and I learned the story of the Salt March. Gandhi studied Jesus' teachings and learned nonviolence. When British colonizers declared that Indians could no longer produce salt from salt water, and instead had to buy heavily taxed salt to increase the British Empire's ridiculous wealth, the people suffered. 1900 years after Jesus led a nonviolent march to confront an oppressive empire's economic injustice, Gandhi walked 24 days in prayer, in peace, to honor his people. 79 people marched on day one, and each day the crowd grew at one point, the crowd was two miles long. They walked to the coast, they gathered salt water, they produced salt, and this was illegal. Who else led peasant marches and gleaned the earth's goodness and got in trouble for it? Gandhi planned a march to a government salt factory, a home of British oppressive rule, in the spirit of nonviolence which includes transparency and the eternal hope that enemies would become friends, Gandhi wrote to the regional British authorities about his plans. He was arrested. They hoped the march wouldn't happen without Gandhi, but it did. With Gandhi's wife, Kastraba, leading the crowd of hundreds, she was arrested next, but the people kept marching. They had trained, prayed, they were committed to nonviolence. And then the British police began beating the marchers with steel-tipped lathies. Journalist Webb Miller was there and wrote, Not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like tenpins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowd of watchers groaned and sucked in their breath in sympathetic pain at every blow. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious, writhing in pain with fractured skulls, broken shoulders. In two or three minutes, the ground was quilted with bodies. Great patches of blood widened on their white clothes. The survivors, without breaking ranks, silently and doggedly marched on until struck down. Finally, the police became enraged by the non-resistance. They commenced savagely kicking the seated men in the abdomen and testicles. The police then began dragging the sitting men by their arms, by their feet, sometimes for a hundred yards, and throwing them into ditches. And it took 20 more years, and thousands more people were killed, and finally India's independence was restored. India's history is a lot like the Israelites. India had been ruled by various foreign powers and invaders and elite, just like the Israelites. Indian people have gone centuries at a time without self-determination. We follow a leader who led poor people into confrontation with empire, who was arrested to stop the people from clamoring for respect and daily bread, but it didn't work. But the rebellion hasn't fully succeeded yet either not for Palestine or India or any of us. We're impatient. We're tired of staying home, frustrated. We can't go to parties or have Easter lunch with the whole family. We're worried about our jobs. We're worried about the nurses and doctors we love who don't have the personal protective equipment that they need. We're anxious for our country's problems exposed by this crisis to be solved. Which leader has a plan? We are voting next month. With all that passion and desperation, with even more, because they had been hearing a Messiah promised for millennia, Jewish peasants looked to Jesus marching through Jerusalem's golden gate on a donkey and cry, Hosanna, deliver us. They aren't saved that day. On that march, the people take two steps forward, but then they take one step back. Jesus is betrayed. Jesus is arrested. The disciples flee in fear. 
The people have been waiting so long for deliverance, for reunification, for peace. They don't want to wait any longer. They turn their backs on Jesus. He let them down. We might have thought the same thing if we had been there, but we know what comes next. We read Holy Week, stories without much sympathy for the people. We think of them as fickle. But how much patience do you have for leaders? Why can't they pass the right health care bill? Why can't they fix the potholes? Why can't they solve the opioid crisis in our country? When they decline the WHO tests and then create a test kit that doesn't even work, we're not patient. And we are not even living under occupation. How are we the ones caught up in the mob mentality, living amongst our culture, our society, that lulls us into shouting, Hosanna, one week, and crucify him the next? Now, maybe you didn't hoard any toilet paper. Maybe you didn't blame China. Maybe you haven't been making fun of people wearing homemade masks. But when people write the story in the years and millennia to come, what will we have gotten right? What right things will we have failed to do? And what will have been our biggest mistakes? It's not helpful to weigh one oppression against another. Most of us at Crest Manor have enormous privilege we have secure lives. All of this makes us feel insecure, but compared to most people in the world, we have so much security. And yet some of us do experience oppression and every single one of us experiences struggle, but we all have self-determination on a basic level. We do, we're all citizens. We have the right to march, to protest, to advocate. We have the responsibility to do so. When he walked arm in arm with John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, my feet were praying. How many times has passionate faith planted us in holy ground? How many times has our faith put our bodies on the line? How many times has your faith convicted you to work alongside your sisters and brothers, to welcome God's kingdom on earth. Peace pilgrims, sojourners and marchers, we may be in the tradition of Jesus' Palm Sunday parade. And still, is it working? Jesus didn't overthrow the Roman Empire with his humble donkey procession. When pastors and school kids and cleaning ladies and factory workers marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965, they were headed for Montgomery to register to vote, and they were beaten by police. Dozens were hospitalized. It took three tries to get to Montgomery, two steps forward and one step back. Many African Americans were finally allowed to vote because the civil rights marchers put their bodies on the line. And in the past decade, voting rights have been eroding. So maybe it's one step forward and two steps back. Did Jesus fail as a political revolutionary? Jesus makes his own prophecies about Jerusalem, the city he watches and weeps crying, if only you had known the things that make for peace, the days will come when your enemies will hem you in on every side. They will not leave one stone upon another. The city, Jesus says, kills the prophets and stones the ones who are sent to it. Jesus prophesies about himself, declaring his own torture and death will take place when he reaches Jerusalem. It won't be long now. It won't be long. And what else does he say? What does he say to us? If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. A cross to carry isn't just any burden to bear. 
dying on the cross as punishment for insurrection, for rebellion against Rome. Jesus doesn't say, follow me and suffer. Jesus says, follow me and die, a revolutionary. Unlike Jesus' friends and followers in year 30, we are not living under occupation. What does it mean to follow Jesus as citizens of U.S. empire? Will you wave your palm and shout, Hosanna, as Jesus marches into Jerusalem? It won't be long now. It won't be long till Jesus reaches the temple, till Jesus reaches the cross. Are you marching with him? Where is your cross? What table does it upset? What gap does it bridge? What wall does it topple? The table of ex economic exploitation, the gap between pure and impure, worthy and unworthy, the wall between peasant and priest. Does your cross upset the tables where billionaires sit divvying up the profits they have pilfered from this planet? Does your cross bridge any gap between the ones eating from food pantry boxes and the ones eating boxes of their favorite takeout? Does your cross topple any wall between the US and Mexico? Who are you marching with? Do you stand with Pilate, Rome, safe in empire? Do you drop your coat in the dust, wave a palm for a peasant on a colt? What revolutions do you bear on your back? Hold in your heart, praise in your prayers. It won't be long now, it won't be long. Jesus Messiah doesn't overthrow the Roman Empire by riding a donkey through the Golden Gate. He overthrows the Roman Empire's soul when he suffers even unto death, when he proclaims love and forgiveness from the cross. He liberates our souls and teaches us that the good news of radical love and self-sacrifice cannot be sold, will not be walled, shall never die. Jesus' liberation is in our hearts, regardless of our citizenship. Jesus' liberation is in our souls, regardless of our bank balance. Jesus' liberation is in our bodies, regardless of our social status. But Jesus' gospel is not indifferent to our political, physical, economic circumstances. Not even for a moment does Jesus' liberation exist separately from the realities of our lives. Jesus says, feed the people, give the thirsty water, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, tend to the sick. Jesus cares about our bodies and our whole beings. Jesus, Messiah, overthrows the Roman Empire's soul, but the Roman Empire oppresses people for hundreds more years. The Messiah's mission is already and not yet complete. And Jesus Messiah confronts not just the Roman Empire on his march into Jerusalem, he confronts the temple. He confronts the place both beloved and broken, his own people's creation that has been corrupted. This isn't just about speaking truth to foreign occupiers, but calling out what is corrupt within our own communities. Jesus calls us to live abundantly with the gospel good news. We are already and not yet there. We don't choose to march with Jesus just once. We choose it again and again, day after day. And sometimes it feels like we have to relearn it now with standing six feet away and washing our hands and waiting and waiting for the other shoe to drop. We have so much work to do, so many walls to topple, so much bread to break with our neighbors and our enemies, so much forgiveness to ask and to offer. Today we march with Jesus, the peasant king. Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. We are already and not yet liberated. We are already and not yet citizens of God's kingdom and marching with Jesus we sing. It won't be long now, it won't be long. It won't be long now, it won't be long till justice comes rolling like a mighty stream. It won't be long now, it won't be long.